cloud. We are recording. And yeah. So welcome to the third episode of the COVID Clarity Business Navigation Series, which features experts in the, their field who help guide us through the complexities of operating business during the ever-changing conditions brought on by the global pandemic. The COVID Clarity Series is sponsored by the Seoul District Business Association, Sussman and Shank LLP, Gordon Reese Scully Mann Sus Suscani, and is moderated by Flossen Media. Uh, I am Stephen Christian, and I will be your host for today's presentation, where we welcome attorney, attorney Elizabeth Selmer, who is a partner and chair of the Employment Law Group at Sussman Shank LLP. At her firm, Elizabeth advises a diverse group of clients in a broad range of business and employment matters. Her employment practice includes counseling employers on a wide range of complex employment issues, including federal and Oregon leave laws, workplace harassment and discrimination, Oregon and Washington sick leave laws, compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and equivalent uh, Oregon statute, employment dis employee discipline and documentation, wage and hour issues, and issues related to employee classification. Additionally, Elizabeth prepares employment and severance agreements, employee handbooks, employee policies, and conducts on-site training for employee, employers on harassment, discrimination, and medical leave. Today, Attorney Selmer will present on the Oregon Occupational Safety and Health Division's Temporary Rule Advising COVID-19 Workplace Risks, or OAR 4370101-0744, which took effect on November 16, 2020. The rule creates a number of new obligations for employers and includes provisions generally applicable to all workplaces and specific rules for exceptional risk workplace, as well as guidance for specific industries and types of businesses. This presentation will discuss the requirements generally applicable to workplaces and the deadlines for compliance. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please add them to the chat and we will address them. Uh, there will also be an opportunity for group discussion at the end of the presentation. And so uh, without further ado, help me in welcoming Attorney Sommer and hopefully you guys all have a good morning in the audience and uh, let's get things thing. Let's get these things rolling. So uh, welcome. Good morning. Welcome. So I'm Elizabeth Semler, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, we're going to be talking about some new administrative rules that um, came out about a week and a half ago, a week ago, and I want to give you some background to start with. So the Oregon Occupational Safety and Health um, Division is the state agency responsible for workplace safety and health in Oregon, and it operates um, cooperatively with the Federal um, Occupational Health and Safety Administration. So I'm going to refer to OR OSHA as the Oregon agency and OSHA as the federal agency. And um, the federal agency, as you probably know, is part of the Department of Labor. This new administrative rule um, was created by OR OSHA to implement safety precautions. And um, it's sort of interesting that it came out in November. We started sort of with the pandemic was declared in March. So this, these rules compile all of the knowledge, all of the learning, all of the um, scientific information that has been collected to this point on how you make workplaces safe. And it includes guidance from both the Oregon Health Authority and the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. So it basically, um, adopts rules that businesses must um, implement. And depending upon the size of your business, you um, will have different obligations in terms of how you implement these different requirements. One thing that's interesting to note is Oregon is only the third state in the United States to adopt these kind of special temporary rules. The other two are Virginia and Michigan. 
And the rules, as I said, build on the Oregon Health Authority's existing rules and guidance and on CDC rules. Finally, it's going to be really important, depending upon your specific industry, that you double check the actual temporary rule, which there's a link to in the materials, which I'm going to share in a minute, and that you read the different appendices for specific industries. Because what or OSHA did was issue a rule that's generally applicable. First part of the rule has a bunch of definitions. Second part has the general requirements that we're going to talk about. And then there are multiple appendices applicable to different industries and different businesses. So everything from restaurants, bars, breweries, retails, outdoor and indoor markets, um, personal service providers. So you need to both read the general rule and then read the specific rules applicable to the industries. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And um, you should see a lovely introductory screen. There it is. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And let's go through some basics. So the rule took effect on um, November 16th. It's going to be in place until May 4th unless they extend it. It applies to all employees who work in places of employment subject to or OSHA jurisdiction. And it addresses, as I said before, workplaces generally, as well as exceptional risk workplaces, which is primarily in the healthcare setting and industries and businesses by category. These rules don't replace the rules and guidance that the Oregon Health Authority has already issued. They supplement and um, incorporate those rules. So, as you all know, Oregon has multiple rules about wearing masks, face coverings, and face shields. And what the most, the biggest change that this or OSHA temporary rule implements is that you now must allow an employee to wear a mask if they want to. Um, so, for example, under Oregon Health Authority guidance, there are some rules that allow an employee to take their mask off, for example, in a private office. Not right now during the freeze when we're all supposed to be staying home, but prior to the freeze, you could, if you had to, go into your office to work. And if you went into a private office with, where there were no other employees, you could take your mask off. Now, an employee is, has to be allowed to wear a mask if they want to. The link to general mask guidance is here. And you will also see that in that guidance, um, the Oregon Health Authority recently changed its position on the use of face shields without masks. So it's generally not recommended that um, a mask or face covering be replaced with just a plastic face shield. So the new rule has some requirements about posting and notification. Uh, you have to post the COVID-19 hazard poster in a conspicuous place and provide a copy to your employees electronically if they're working remotely. That can be as simple as sending everybody an email that says, hey, take a look at this COVID-19 hazard poster. Um, a link to the poster is in your materials, and it's also shown on the screen below. Um, pretty simple, just general guidance about COVID-19. The rule implements a new requirement with respect to notifying employees of one exposure or two, a positive case in the same facility or portion of facility. So previously there was, there were, there was guidance on how and what you did, but there was not a requirement that you notify employees within 24 hours that they've either had a work-related contact with somebody who tested positive or that somebody tested positive in their general workplace. Now you must do that within 24 hours. There's a form available on the OR OSHA website. Remember, the notice cannot identify the name of the infected employee unless that employee gives you consent. That's a HIPAA violation. So you need to send the um, notice uh, generally, or I should say anonymously, unless an employee consents to your disclosing that they are the person who tested positive. Um, so, there had not been a lot of guidance on 
how employers from a safety standpoint were supposed to handle quarantine and isolation of infected employees. There is a lot, there are a lot of rules with respect to the kind of leave you have to give them. And the CDC has rules about how long people have to stay out. But now um, employers are obligated to allow an employee who's been instructed to quarantine or isolate to work at home if they can work at home, meaning if suitable remote work is available and if they are well enough to work from home. And you have to put the person back to their previous job without any adverse action as a result of their quarantining or isolating. So it's a little bit like the reinstatement rules under the Oregon Family Leave Act, with of course two exceptions. The exception that if the job has been eliminated, you don't have to create a job, meaning if it was eliminated while the person was isolating. Um, and you can have somebody else do the job temporarily while the employee is at home. And then when you allow the employee to come back, you have to do it pursuant to applicable, applicable public health authority. So for example, many employers require a negative test before an employee can return to work or OSHA does not require that. It says as long as they have um, quarantined for the applicable time period, they should be able to come back to work without proving that they have tested negative. Okay, so one of the bigger obligations of the new rule is that all employers must undertake a risk assessment. And if you're familiar with OSHA rules generally, risk assessments are a thing that employers have to do, but this is new with respect to COVID-19. <clears throat> and the deadline for employers to conduct this risk assessment is fast approaching. It's December 7th, 2020. And the um, website includes a form, you can see it on the screen, that is your risk assessment form. Now, if you, when we get to the next slide, I'll talk about who has to do it in writing, but generally you have to conduct this risk, exposure risk assessment, and you have to allow your employees to participate, whether you do that through a safety meeting, whether you just convene a group of employees to talk about it. There are multiple ways you can do it, but you are supposed to do it collaboratively with your employees. And if you have 10 or more employees, you have to complete this assessment in writing. And the risk assessment, um, I want to go back for one second, the employee participation in the actual rule, it says it must involve participation and feedback from employees. This may be achieved by a safety meeting, safety committee, supervisor, process negotiated with the exclusive bargaining agent or any other similarly interactive process. So you're going to have to get a group of people together to undertake this risk assessment. It includes multiple questions, some more specific than others. I wanna go through them generally, but you should really look at the rule to determine um, what the risk assessment specifically includes. So here's what you have to assess. Generally, can your work employees telework or work remotely? What are the anticipated working distances between employees? That's generally your analysis of whether you can maintain physical distance of six feet or more. What's the anticipated working distance between employees and other individuals? That's, for example, customers, visitors to your workplace. Can you maintain your six feet of physical distance? Um, how have workplace employer job duties been modified to allow people to maintain six feet of distance? Have you, for example, change the configuration of cubicles? Have you had it so that employees' desks are moved more than 10 feet apart? Have you um, done other things to modify the workplace to maintain that distance? Um, then your analysis has, your assessment has to look at how are you telling people about the requirement that they wear masks, face shields? Now, we all know that we're supposed to, from our earlier slide, post, so in your risk assessment, your answer is I'm telling them by posting and making sure everybody has the Oregon Health Authority guidance. Again, more questions to ask. How have employees been informed about workplace policy and procedures related to reporting? What have you told people they need to do if they discover that they are positive or that they're infected or that they've had close contact with somebody? Now, 
Next is how have engineering controls such as ventilation and physical barriers been used to minimize exposure? So have you installed um, plexiglass uh, dividers, things like that? Have you changed how your um, HVAC system works to create greater air circulation? Then um, next thing your assessment looks at is how have administrative controls been used? So have you put um, directional arrows on the, in the hallways to make sure people are going one direction and staying distance from each other? Um, what are you doing to make sure the flow of people maintains physical distance? Um, then what's the procedure or policy for employees to report workplace, workplace hazards related to COVID-19? So that's how have you told employees to tell you when there are situations or um, physical issues that they believe are going to create risk? And then um, how are you coordinating all of these notices and requirements among your employees? And if you, as I said, have more than 10 employees, you're going to have to fill out the form in writing and have it on file to show that you have undertaken this risk assessment. And the specific rules have some additional points. Um, so for example, one of the things you have to look at is your back, is your um, engineering controls with respect to ventilation. Now, I'm not an HVAC specialist, but when you look at the rule, it says, for example, you know, have you used portable air filtration units equipped with HEPA filters, airborne infection isolation rooms, physical barriers? So there's a lot of very specific um, points that you want to look at. They're not in these slides, but they are in the rules. So if you own and operate a business and you are in control of the ventilation and HVAC systems, you'll want to take a look specifically at the rule to see what your obligations are. Okay, so your next obligation, again, you have to get this done by December 7th of this year, is to establish and implement an infection control plan. And that plan is going to be based on your risk assessment. And it's going to adopt controls, including how is your ventilation system going to be modified or adapted to increase airflow to minimize risk? Um, are you going to stagger shifts of when people come into the office to make sure that you can maintain physical distance? Are you going to redesign? Are you going to move desks around? Are you going to change the configuration of your workplace to enable physical distancing? Um, how can you reduce the use of shared surfaces and tools? Um, how can you limit the number of people in different work areas? So for example, you need to look at your break rooms and your lunch rooms and your bathrooms and determine how you can maintain the right um, concentration of individuals at any one time. So some employers have taken the approach of only one person can go in the bathroom at one time. And how are we gonna make sure you know the bathroom is occupied? We're gonna put up tap lights. You know those lights you put up in your closet, you tap and they turn on. You can put them on the floor in front of the bathroom and somebody taps it with their foot when they go in and now other people know nobody else can go in. So that's, something that has to go in your infection control plan. How are you going about limiting the number of employees in different work areas? Um, and then your infection control plan has to discuss personal protective equipment. Keep in mind, personal protective equipment is referring to um, equipment used that's not masks and face coverings. So in industries and businesses, including in the healthcare where you're actually wearing um, N95 masks or other kinds of respirators, that's got to go into your infection control plan. All right, so this slide has way too much information on it. And I really couldn't think of a way to put less on it. But again, 
the rule is very specific with respect to what employer obligations are in putting together this infection control plan. So again, the number of employers, the, the threshold for having to do this in writing formally is 10 employees. So as you see, it says employers with more than 10 employees, in addition to workplaces at exceptional risk, and that's primarily healthcare. You have to have your infection control plan in writing and you have to make it available to your employees. And here's the list of things that have to go in it. Now there is a form, I think it's either is available or is going to be made available by or OSHA that you can fill out, but it has to contain at a minimum. So all of the job assignments or tasks that require the use of PPE, including respirators. The procedure you're using to ensure there's an adequate supply of masks, face shields, face coverings, and PPE. Description of hazard control measures that you've installed to minimize employee exposure. And again, all of those things have been identified in your risk assessment. Um, a description of your mask, face covering, and face shield requirements. How are you going to tell people that those requirements exist? How are you going to communicate about exposure? And um, what are you going to do to give people information and training required by this new rule? We'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> so in addition to assessing the risk and determining how to minimize risk in your workplace, Coming up with an infection control plan, which again is attempting to minimize risk and limit exposure, or OSHA wants us to put in place training for employees. They have not yet issued training materials, but I understand that they will be posting training materials on their website as well as potentially training videos. Now, excuse me. <clears throat> the deadline to provide the training is December 21st. And you're going to have to provide them with information and training. It doesn't say what the difference between information and training is, although my assumption is that the, um, the two are, are sort of part and parcel. They're one and the same. And it says information and training can be provided remotely using computer-based modules, but it has to be provided in a manner and language understood by affected workers. If you have been dealing with COVID-19 in your workplace since March, you are likely aware of CDC guidance on how to keep your workplace safe. The CDC has issued multiple um, different directives for different kinds of businesses on what they should do in order to keep their employees safe. And the Training is most likely going to be a combination of the existing CDC guidance on how employees can, one, maintain good hygiene, sanitation in the workplace. Two, it's probably going to cover things like, well, why don't I just go to the slide that tells you what it's got to cover, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so. <clears throat> Here's what OR OSHA says your training has to cover. Physical distancing requirements. You gotta tell people about how they have to stay six feet apart and how that those requirements are going to be applied to the, the, to the specific workplace. So for example, um, in manufacturing, you might have to move workstations apart from each other. You're gonna have to train employees on how you have set things up to keep them six feet apart. You're going to have to provide training on masks, face covering, or face shield requirements as they apply to the employer, employee's workplace and their job function. So, for example, there are employees whose job function is forward facing. They see visitors, they see clients. Those mask and face shield requirements might be different from an employee working alone in a warehouse where they have no contact with any third party. Your training is going to have to cover sanitation requirements. And the sanitation requirements, we'll talk about this a little bit in a minute, 
are everything from good hand washing hygiene to wiping down high touch surfaces to not sharing utensils, um, things like that. Signs and symptoms and symptom reporting procedures. So everybody, I think by now has seen the poster that the CDC puts out that says symptoms of COVID-19. You got to post that, you got to train people to provide them with the information of what those symptoms are. And then you have to tell them about how they report if they are having symptoms to you. Is that a hotline number you're going to set up? Is it you want them to call the human resources department? Is it you want them to email somebody? What, what's your procedure for somebody to tell you, I believe I have symptoms of COVID-19? Your training has to include the infection notification process. So that will essentially incorporate the form we talked about earlier, meaning you now have to tell people within 24 hours. So you're gonna put your train in your training, you're gonna say, this is how we notify, this is when we notify, this is what we do. Um, medical removal, again, you're gonna tell people, hey, if you have to stay home and quarantine, you can, and then when you're ready to come back to work after you've either stayed home for 14 days or 10 days, depending upon what your medical provider has ordered, you can come back. Um, characteristics and methods of transmission of COVID-19. I think um, there's a fair amount of Oregon Health Authority and CDC guidance on this, but my assumption is that the training materials that or OSHA makes available to employers will include how they want you to um, explain this to people. Then symptoms of COVID-19, again, that's a little bit duplicative of the earlier point, but the training has to tell people what to look for. Um, the idea that at this point, people are not aware of what the symptoms are would be surprising to me, but your obligation as the employer is to make sure people know what to look for so they don't come into work and get people sick. Okay, so then you have to train them on the ability of pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals to transmit COVID-19. To me, this is a kind of, it's a kind of strange one because basically what we're saying is, you might not know you're sick, but you can still get everybody else sick. So keep that in mind as you go about your business. And you have to tell people that. Um, part of that plays into why we're gonna wear our mask all the time because you might not know that you're sick. So if you wear your mask, you are less likely to get someone else sick, um, but that's gotta be part of your training. And then safe and healthy work practices and control measures, including physical distancing, sanitation, and disinfectant, disinfection practices. Um, <clears throat> now, many of you have already been doing a large number of the points that are required in this training. You have your signs posted, you have your CDC guidance on symptoms. You have your how to be safe in the office. You have your hand washing posters. So a lot of this is um, belt and suspenders, I would say, from what we've already been doing. But the big difference is this is now part of an administrative rule, which has compliance obligations, meaning you potentially as an employer need to show that you have provided employees with training that includes educating them on each of these points. And as I said, the training um, has to be completed by December 21st, 2020. I looked at the OR OSHA website this morning and I did not see a link to sample training materials, but my, I, I would anticipate that they will be up there by December 1st at the latest. And the, uh, just to add, the administrative rule permits you as an employer to create your own training. And in fact, the rule has a little note which says, to the degree training provided before the adoption of this rule complies with all or any portion of the required training, the employer does not need to repeat the training, but may need to take steps to ensure that additional information is covered 
and that appropriate employee feedback can be provided. So again, to the extent you have already trained and provided information to your employees on the elements in the rule, what they're saying is you don't have to do it again. Um, there isn't anything in the rule that I have seen that shows how you document that you've provided the training in the way that when you do harassment or discrimination training, um, employees sign an acknowledgement of some sort, but presumably you'll want to keep records of when and how you provided the training and information to your employees so that you can comply with this obligation. Okay, so employee testing. This is a, it will depend upon your workplace, how much or how little this impacts you. So first of all, it says you have to cooperate by making room for testing. Basically says you have to cooperate by making its employees an appropriate space available at no cost to workers whenever a local public health agency or Oregon Health Authority indicate that diagnostic testing within the workplace is necessary. So um, typically this will occur in a larger workplace where, for example, you have um, positive tests and OHA wants to come onto your premises and do testing. Um, typically it would happen in, a, you know, we've had a bunch of outbreaks in larger manufacturing or food processing plants. That's the kind of situation where they're saying, you employer must allow us to come onto your premises and do testing and you have to um, provide us with some place to do our work. And then, it says that if the testing is conducted at the employer's direction, you have to cover the cost of testing, including the cost of the test, employee time and employee travel. So that's if you're requiring tests of your employees. And if you're not requesting the test, you don't have to cover the cost. So if you have an employee that says, well, I don't feel comfortable coming back to work without a negative test, and you employer are like, well, if you stayed home for 14 days, we don't want you to, we don't care if you have a test, you employer are not going to have to pay for that under this rule. And uh, as an aside, employers should look at the EEOC website for guidance on testing in connection with COVID-19. So prior to the pandemic, requiring an employee to get a, a, med a test of any kind would be a medical examination that has significant restrictions under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Because of the pandemic, the EEOC has changed the guidance on testing and on when employers can require testing. So if you are asking or requiring employees to test negative before returning to work or imposing other kinds of requirements related to testing, you should read the EEOC guidance on that. Sorry, a little bit of an aside, but okay. This is information that we all are pretty much aware of by now because even though it's just been made part of an actual rule, it has been the Oregon Health Authority's direction for quite some time which is that you have to ensure that work activities and workflow are designed to eliminate the need for any employee to be within six feet of another individual um, unless, you can determine, unless you determine and can demonstrate that physical distancing is not feasible for certain activities. So there are certainly um, job functions or um, work requirements where two employees must work next to each other. They must work collaboratively to get something done. But in the absence of those situations, you've got to figure out a way to keep people six feet apart. Then there is um, some rule rules about employees driving in vehicles together. You have to wear masks is basically the rule. If employees are in a car, in a bus, in a van all together, 
they need to wear a face covering or a face shield unless they're wearing actual respirators. So unless they're wearing, um, it's kind of like personal protective equipment of a higher level. Now, I could do a 10 hour presentation on how to clean your workplace, because that would bore you all to tears. And if you are the owner or operator of a business that is subject to some of the more to some of the stricter cleaning and sanitation obligations, you're probably well aware of them by now because they're on the CDC website, they're on the OSHA website. But in the temporary rule, there is some updated information about minimum obligations for sanitation. And so those are listed here and I want to um, just read them specifically. So you have to clean or sanitize common areas, shared equipment, high touch services, the high touch surfaces. And the definitions of those are at the beginning of the rule um, that are under an employer's control and that are used by employees or the public. And you have um, a time obligation. So basically it says you have to clean or sanitize at least once every 24 hours if the workplace is occupied less than 12 hours a day or at least every eight hours while in use if the workplace is occupied more than 12 hours a day. I think most businesses at this point are cleaning every night. So um, it's happening once every 12, 24 hours and then there is additional cleaning going on during the day as people are using shared equipment, but the rule sets this as a minimum of what you have to do. And then it says here, there's an exception, which is if you have only drop-in availability or minimal staffing, then you can use your regular cleaning schedule, but your employees should sanitize their own work surfaces. So that's if you have somebody coming into the office twice a week to pick up the mail, twice a week to um, you know answer phone calls and respond to emails, and otherwise there's nobody there, you don't have to follow this 24 hour or 12 hour cleaning protocol, follow your regular protocols and that employee should be cleaning and sanitizing their own workspace. Okay. And because OSHA and or OSHA loves cleaning as we all do at this point, you have to provide your employees with cleaning supplies and you have to give them the time to clean or sanitize more frequently than you would otherwise need um, if the employee wants to do so. Um, so in, in my world, because generally um, in professional services, an employee can take five minutes and wipe down their desk if they want, it's not an issue. In some other industries where you have um, more production-based employees, you're gonna have to let the employees take a break if they want to wipe down their surface. You're gonna have to let an employee clean things up if they feel they need to. So it's basically more frequently than would otherwise be required if the worker chooses to do so. Um, I don't think it'll be a, a, an issue, but you have to let people clean their workplace if they want to. And then you have to give them supplies and reasonable time to perform hand hygiene before using shared equipment. So that means they have to be able to go wash their hands or they have to be able to use hand sanitizer if they are going to be using equipment that other people touch. Then, again, this is not in healthcare settings. That's a whole nother world. But generally, you have to clean and disinfect common or high touch surfaces and any shared equipment that has been known to be infected with COVID-19 or used by somebody who had COVID-19. The CDC website has a ton of guidance on what you should specifically do when you have an employee who tests positive and has been in your workplace within um, 48 hours prior to that positive test that guidance um, sort of beyond the scope of this presentation, but it tells you 
what and how you should go about disinfecting the areas around the employee who tested positive, the areas where the employee might have touched things. You know, if it's an employee that, for example, used the copy machine the day before they were tested positive, you're going to have to go follow that CDC guidance and clean this copy machine. Same thing with staplers, pens, pencils, um, desks. But generally, the rules require you to clean and disinfect areas where somebody who tests positive has touched stuff. Now, it's stuff that other people are potentially going to touch. So if I were to go into my private office and two days later test positive, I think it would be okay for my employer to simply shut my door and not let anybody in there. But otherwise, you got to follow these cleaning and sanitation rules. Okay, so there is a lot of guidance in the rules about common areas and areas where employees of other employers work. So if you own a building and your employees on, are on the first floor and you rent out the second and third floors, you have obligations with respect to the employees on floors two and three because you operate or control the building where those employees work. So your obligations for common areas include making sure that sanitation requirements, requirements are met on those other floors and posting signs about masks, face shields throughout the building. And you can do that using the Oregon Health Authority mask face shield poster, which there is a link to in your materials. And I just wanted to look at the rule specifically. Um, hang on one second, because I think there was one other common area requirement that I wanted to share with you that is not in the slide. All right, I'll get back to it because apparently it's not jumping out of my notes. Okay, now, again, remember earlier when I said I'm not an HVAC expert? Let me repeat, I'm not an HVAC expert. However, if you are in control of a building or workplace, no later than January 6th, you have to optimize the amount of outside air circulated through your existing heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems to the extent the system can do so when operating as designed. Whenever there are employees in the workplace and the outdoor air quality index remains at either good or moderate. Basically, you need to do everything you can to consult with whoever operates the HVAC of your building to make sure that you are getting as much outside air circulated through as possible, except when we have wildfires and you can't breathe the air outside, which was a problem this summer. You have to maintain and replace air filters to ensure the proper function of your HVAC system. And then you have to main, so this is where we get to the technical stuff. You have to maintain your intake ports that provide outside air. I cannot tell you how you do that or what that actually means, but again, go to the specific language of the rule and talk to the whoever operates the HVAC, HVAC of your building and they will help you. Okay, so here is another somewhat not technical requirement for people who operate a building. So this deadline is basically today. And it says that if you operate or control a building where employees of other employers work, meaning we'll use our example again, you own a building or you rent a whole building and your employees are on the first floor and somebody else's employees are on the second and third floors, you have to Take the following steps in common areas to the extent that you have control over the common areas. Ensure sanitation requirements are met. Post signs in areas where masks, 
covering or face shields are required, meaning put up your OHA sign. Okay, so as I said at the beginning of the presentation, there are specific rules for specific industries and activities at the back of the temporary rule. And for each of those particular industries, you have to read your requirements and then apply them. So they supplement what is in this general guidance that we've just covered. So I'll give you an example. Let's go to the first appendix. So the mandatory workplace guidance for restaurants, bars, brew pubs, public tasting rooms at breweries, wineries, and distilleries. And in that appendix, it has some very specific rules about physical distancing. So you, if you are a person who operates one of those businesses, you have to do the following. Ensure tables are spaced at least six feet apart so that at least six feet of parties, six feet between parties is maintained, including when customers approach or leave tables. You have to determine appropriate seating configuration to comply with these physical distancing requirements. You may allow for footprint expansion to outside space for service while maintaining the physical distancing requirements. And then the rules get even more specific. So if booth seating is back to back, you must use no more than every other booth unless a barrier is installed in accordance with the following. Install acrylic, plexiglass, lexin, or other impermeable physical barrier that is easily cleaned. If the barrier is at least one foot higher than head level for customers seated and at least three feet wide or at least the width of the seat. So again, I hate to beat a dead horse here, but if you operate one of the specific businesses that's listed in the appendices to the temporary rule, you've got to first go through the general provisions we just talked about and make sure you're complying with each of those. And then you've got to drill down into the specific rules for your particular industry or business. Um, so, and, and they get very, very specific. So I haven't put that in the slides, but there are provisions for video lottery terminals. Like how do you keep those, how do you keep patrons safe when they use those? How do you keep employees safe when you have those in your workplace? and so on. So um, retail store guidance, there's some specific information. And the information is not all new. So some of it incorporates previous guidance and directives from the Oregon Health Authority, from the CDC. And some of it you have to read again, because it might be new. And I haven't on, I have not analyzed for each specific industry, what changed in this rule as to what existed previously. But in the temporary rule, most of what we've talked about where there's now a deadline for compliance, that is new. And um, the other bullet points generally call out what is in addition or supplemental to existing authority. Okay, this is the last thing which is very off topic but I have gotten a lot of questions from employers about it. So it's not really off topic, it's off topic of the temporary rule. So as you probably know, OSHA requires employers to report certain kinds of workplace illnesses and injuries to OSHA and to record certain kinds of workplace injuries and illnesses solely for their own records keeping purposes. And only recently did federal OSHA put out guidance on when a COVID-19 infection of an employee has to be reported to OSHA. So separate from recording, when do you as the employer have to notify OSHA? The, the rule, and I would suggest you go to this link and read all of the guidance, but basically in order to be reportable, an inpatient hospitalization due due to COVID-19 must occur within 24 hours of an exposure to COVID-19 at work. And what 
OSHA explains is an employer must report such hospitalization within 24 hours of knowing both that the employee has been in both of the inpatient hospitalization and that the reason for the hospitalization was a work-related exposure to COVID-19. It's a pretty high benchmark. And then separately, the fact that workplace exposure is not reportable doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't report it. And so guidance on work-related COVID-19 infections of employees for reporting is also listed on the OSHA website. And if you're an employer who's already doing OSHA recording and reporting, none of this will seem new to you, but I have had a number of employers contact me with questions about finding out an employee tested positive and whether it is reportable as opposed to recordable. Okay, so I have about five minutes left and I know that I went very fast and talked a lot and your head is probably spinning and you want to leave and have coffee, but are there any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, there were definitely some questions in the chat as you went through. Uh, and man, that, that's a that's it's definitely a lot of information. So good thing that we recorded this. And so you guys will all be able to uh, see this on the Seoul District website uh, if you have any questions or you want to review the material. Uh, but one of them, uh, a few of them were uh, one, uh, what of these uh, apply to the construction industry specifically? Uh, you know, especially when it comes to uh, like risk, risk assessment and stuff. So like what, what, are, the, what are the things that specifically uh, apply to the construction industry? Um, so let me just pull up the appendix and make sure. So if you go to appendix A5, which is workplace guidance for construction operations, it will take you to what specifically applies or doesn't apply from the general rule that I was just describing. So you should assume that everything in the temporary rule generally applicable to employers applies to everyone. And then look at appendix A5 to see whether there are carve outs for construction or additional obligations for construction. Um, and then I would also go on the CCB website, the Construction Contractors Board will have done some analysis of this temporary rule and some explanation for employers specifically in that industry. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And I believe uh, Christopher has a question he would like to ask. Uh, it looks you like you're unmute. muted. Uh, unmute. Yeah. Sorry about that. I was just asking, was um, this going to be a, this whole presentation in the form of a handbook or something that I could, it was a lot of information that I could share with my, only have a couple, two or three employees, but what's the best way to diffuse, disperse this information to, to my employees, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I think the best way to do it would be to check the website for when the employee training materials come out okay. and circulate the training materials to the employees because it will summarize what you're obligated to tell them. Now, if you have employees that are the employees that are sort of in charge of implementing these rules, mm -hmm. I think what you'll want to do is have them read the temporary rule Okay. And then look, if they want the summary of it, they can look at the slides. I would be in charge of implementing them, actually. So, okay. So yeah. for you, what I would suggest is having <laughs> listened to this, actually sit down and read the temporary rule. Okay. And so you say, you'll see the nuances and the additions to the bullet points that are in the slides. Okay. And what website? Assessment website? Uh, on, on, the, on the slides, there's a link to the temporary rule. Okay, okay, okay. As yeah. well as links to all of the documentation that OR OSHA has created so far for employers to implement the rule. Understood, thank you. Yeah, and Christopher, you should get, um, I believe you will get an email or you will let you know when uh, when all this stuff is posted because we're recording the whole thing. And so okay. you should be able to like review, um, re revisit this video um, okay. at a later time for your okay. reference. Zoom trouble at first, and I did, I missed like a little bit of the first part, but I, I got most of it. But thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, um, and then I think another question is, um, does 
does employers have to pay employees for the 14 day quarantine? So under the, this is not an or OSHA rule. So under the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, employers with 500 or fewer employees are obligated to provide paid sick leave under certain circumstances related to COVID-19, but small businesses can apply for an exemption. So if you have 50 or fewer employees, you might be able to get an exemption from providing paid sick leave. So I would suggest you go to the Department of Labor's website. There is a frequently asked questions link that will walk you through when an employee is entitled to paid sick leave for the 14 day, it's actually 80 hours of quarantine or isolation. That, so that's put another way, that's not something that OSHA covers. That's a benefit that's provided by a different statute. And if you are exempt from that federal law, now we're getting way into the weeds, um, Oregon has put in place temporary paid sick leave that employees can apply for. It's part of the Department of Consumer and Business Services uh, benefits. So that's a completely different department. I would go on the um, Bureau of Labor and Industries website and click on their COVID-19 resource page and it will walk you through all the different kinds of paid leave employees are potentially entitled to in connection with COVID-19. Okay, okay. And I think uh, we have uh, another question and it's asking if employees are carpooling, do they have to wear a mask? My answer would be yes, unless they're in the same family, unless they are in the same household. Um, yeah, they should wear masks. Okay, and then, uh, if there are any other questions, feel free to either put them in the chat or feel free to uh, say them aloud. And if there I aren't... see there's a question here that says, does this apply to businesses that have five or less employees? And the answer is yes. As long as the employees are subject to or OSHA jurisdiction, it applies. The difference would be that if you have 10 or fewer employees, you don't have the obligations to create the written report. Okay, and I believe that is our time. And so uh, if you'd like to listen to this presentation again or share it with others, uh, it will be available on Flossa Media's TV YouTube channel and on the Seoul District Business Association's website. And that is at www.souldistrictbiz.org. And if you have any other questions or ideas uh, for the series, please contact us at outreach at Neneba Portland, so N-N-E-B-A-P-O-R-T-L-A-N-D dot org. And uh, again, I want to thank, um, you know, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I want to thank uh, Attorney Simler for uh, giving us such a, just a, a breadth of information just jam-packed into a uh, one hour. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, you know, I know for myself, you know, uh, the best way to review is just looking back at the looking back at everything. And I think because you had a lot of links on it, um, we can talk about possibly getting uh, some of those links on either the website or on the uh, uh, some of the slides that you that you provided. And, um, then, uh, and one other thing. So on the last page of the slideshow, there's a link to a blog. It's the employment law blog that I write. And all of the materials are linked on our blog as well. So in the interim, if anybody wants to get to information, general employment information, but also all of that, you can go through our blog to get it. Oh, perfect, perfect. We will definitely shoot them over to the blog uh, in, the, in the meantime while we get everything together. And so, uh, and so again, thank you all for, for joining us for another action-packed day or episode of the COVID Clarity Series. Uh, again, my, uh, my name is Stephen Christian. I'm your host, and this is put on by Flossom Media in collaboration with the Seoul District Business Association and Sussman and & Shank. And so, uh, you know, thank you all for joining us, and 
we will uh, see you for the next episode, episode four. Thank you.